Callum, uh, would you join us, please? So this is the last session before lunch. Um, lunch, by the way, will be in the same room as the coffee. We have way too many wraps. There's only two types, uh, both vegetarian, one cheese, one falafel, I think it is. Plus some things to share. Uh, please feel free to take home or to give to students or anyone else, whatever is left over. It's all very, very nice. Personally brought down from London this morning. Uh, what Dave will introduce you to now is what some of the researchers, some of the community here has done over the last while. Uh, I think it's quite amazing. I will sit down. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I, I get the privilege of, of going twice. This is a very different from my first talk. Um, so um, I'm a member of the, the Waste Group, which Les leads, Web and Internet Science. We're both wasters. Um, and um, we have, a, uh, have a, a, a thing that we've run for a number of years called the Waste Fest, where we essentially set a couple of days aside for people in the group to do something which is different than their normal activity. Um, and this year we wanted to run a Waste Fest that was kind of aligned with uh, the future of text. Um, so we started to think about what might be themes, and we thought we'd report back here uh, what we've done, and we ran it a couple of days ago. Um, uh, as you might expect, given that Frodo's involved, we were inspired by Doug Engelbart. Um, and um, I think this, uh, this, this really nice quote up here is, the better we get at getting better, the faster we get better, basically. Um, so, uh, as you know, uh, Engelbart was, uh, was a, a real innovator in the, the, you know, his, uh, his use of knowledge tools. But crucially, he used those tools himself in his own research group. Uh, the idea being that um, if you can improve the rate at which we get better, then this kind of amplifies through the system, and then the people that the, the researchers are working with get maximum benefits. And we get this kind of virtuous cycle of improvement. Um, and it just struck us that we don't do this very much. Um, and I don't think we're unusual as a research group in, in not doing this very much. Um, so the idea of uh, the Waste Fest this year was to take those ideas and to say, can we reflect on and develop our own tools? Right? What are we using? Um, what should we be using? Uh, can we revise our workflows or practices? How can we communicate more effectively? Um, and crucially, what textual tools could we develop that we could then go on and use in our own research? Right? Um, this is bootstrapping, basically. Uh, and it's saying, look, we just don't do this, and we should. So we uh, got a number of uh, groups together. I think we ended up with, uh, we had about six or seven different ideas, but in the end, I think four different things uh, that were done. Uh, the Voice Fest goes on, it takes, it's like, it's a 30 hour period, so it's like a day and a bit, basically. Um, so all of the stuff here is, has to be very small scale. Um, so I just wanted to talk through uh, what we did and then kind of reflect on uh, the ways it, uh, what it tells us, I think, about the way that a, a, a research group works. Um, and although our context is a UK university, I think it probably is something that, uh, that travels fairly well. Um, so our first idea was uh, a group that worked on sham papers. So you may have seen these, that you create these fictional papers. Uh, very often they're used for outing predatory journals by submitting nonsense works and watching them get published. Uh, but here the idea was slightly different. So um, we have uh, a kind of institutional repository. We've got loads of papers in there uh, from <laughs> written by people in the group. Can we use that data to generate um, imaginary papers that, you know, that simulate what would happen if people who have never collaborated did so. Right? Um, and our idea is really uh, to sort of provoke conversation, to reflect a little bit on the, on the, the themes and the, the, you know, the tropes and the language that we use, um, and perhaps to inspire real-life collaborations. Um, and of course, it's a, fun, it's a fun activity to do as well. Um, so uh, Alicia ran this, uh, this group. Um, she downloaded uh, metadata for the web science papers that we have in our uh, repository. Uh, she extracted the titles and the abstracts, and then she used uh, a very simple set of tools for generating that mashup text. So uh, we didn't do anything sophisticated, we just used an off-the-shelf tool uh, called Markoffify, which, as you can imagine, uses Markov chains um, to, to kind of ram together text from different people and see what it looked like. Um, it's deliberately coarse-grained so that people can see um, their work in the resulting outputs um, and helps them kind of understand their contributions. Um, so this is the kind of stuff that we were generating. Um, I think the titles are a little bit more uh, uh, successful than the abstracts, but uh, this is Lisa and Sophia, two PhD students in our group. Uh, collaborative social learning rewards and challenges of researching bug bounties. Um, so the idea being that you kind of see how these two things come together. Um, uh, 
At the moment, it doesn't generate or it doesn't have much cohesion between the title and the abstract, and that's something we'd, they'd have to work on. Um, here's another one: a geographical service, a compass for the Web of Things using DOM, CSS, and JavaScript. Right? And again, you 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 get to see some of the themes, um, some of the, the kind of uh, the crutches, perhaps that the, the research group uses. But it's a, a way of reflecting on. Uh, what your group is, what your part in it is, and thinking about potential collaborations. Uh, so that was one of the one of the things that we did. Um, the second thing we did was uh, was kind of uh, quite quite sort of a well, quite practical really, uh, which is that there are increasingly really useful tools out there that we could be using um, in our own work. So in particular, we were thinking about speech to text generation. Um, uh, a lot of our research, we do uh, interviews, we spend a lot of money on transcription services, or PhD students spend a lot of time doing it themselves because they don't have any money. Um, so can we use those tools to, to sort of uh, enable them to do that much more easily? Um, there's a problem though, which is that back in the day, the way that you do this is you download an application onto your computer and you'd run it and it would all happen locally. That's not the way the world works anymore. These services are cloud-based services, and you essentially give them your data in return for this service. Um, and ethically, um, the university is not very happy about us doing that. Um, research data can be sensitive data. Um, most services are, uh, as I said, cloud-based, and many of them send data outside of the EU, and that's a problem for our university, which is trying to adhere to the, uh, the GDPR, which is the EU uh, data protection legislation. Um, so there's all sorts of data protection and risk assessment hurdles, but the benefits would be enormous. So this group basically said, can we tackle this problem? Um, they spent some time, so I'm not going to go through it, they spent some time sort of setting out the challenges, looking at what other institutions have done and where you might get buy-in. Um, and then crucially, they met with university ethics groups uh, to try to discuss the various options. And they were trying to find uh, a way through this. Is there any way that we can actually use these services by providing advice to academics, being very clear about when it's acceptable and when it isn't, having different kind of tiers of use, providing kind of a training, are there kind of templates we might provide people, you know, what's the infrastructure that we would need to do? Um, so I think after kind of, you know, two days of this effort, some meeting with the research lead, uh, where we got to was that, <laughs> oh, well, we can't do this in, uh, in two days. Uh, but the reasons are interesting. Um, because. It's not because anyone has a fundamental objection to this. It's because the university is such a complicated organization. So it's multiple departments in multiple faculties, multiple ethics committees. You've got legal department. You've got uh, the kind of the, the uh, uh, people who are interested in things like um, uh, you know, academic freedom. And all of these things are kind of uh, interconnected. So it's not that this is an impossible task, but it's just such a tangled piece of string. And no individual researcher has the bandwidth to take on this problem. Right? So I think as a research group, this is something we'll, we'll try and push forward, perhaps working with a single faculty to start with, to see if we can, we can make some progress on it. Um, I minutes. don't think these are... Three minutes. Three minutes, oh my goodness, right, okay. I'm, I'm You're speaking listen. very fast and well, though. Um, so uh, this, this, one's, uh, uh, this is effectively a, a, a short one, because this is Les's one-man army. Um, basically looking at, um, can we use simple analytics to help us understand complex research documents, i.e. a PhD thesis. Uh, these are, are large documents, they're sort of 30 to 70,000 words, they have hundreds of references in them. Um, can you use some kind of analytics uh, to look at that document and see how the references are applied? Um, this is a nameless thesis that I'm not going to out here, uh, but this is an analysis of it. Um, each one of these columns is, is representing a reference. And this is the word count through the thesis. So you can see as the references pile up in the early versions of the thesis, these are the kind of introductory chapters. Um, and then at the top there, when you get to the kind of discussion analysis, how they reoccur again. Um, the, the other colored dots are where that reference reoccurs. So these are the ones that are particularly interesting. Um, and Les was looking essentially at how you can use this type of analysis to, to kind of augment your, uh, your activity as, a, as an examiner. I think we're going to come back and talk a little bit about this stuff later on. I may say exactly the same this afternoon. Right. <laughs> so, and the last one I'm going to overrun, sorry for it. Um, this is your group, so, so you're you talking to well lunch. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, it's just um, everybody's lunchtime, just go ahead, it's brilliant. Um, anyway. yeah. So, yeah. the last one was about, again, taking our publications database, but looking at how can we That's use that as a resource cool. for the group. 
Um, so can we mine our own publications database to find papers that are relevant to the things that we're, we're interested in? Uh, we've got 30 years of publications. There's like 3,500 records, we think, for our, our, our group alone. Um, and that helps individuals because it helps them find interesting references, which is always a challenge. It helps other group members by increasing um, e exposure, <coughs> H-index. Um, and it also helps the group by encouraging a kind of coherent story about the research that's going on in the group and, and building up those kind of things. Um, Callum developed a, a little prototype, do you want to say? And you. Uh, and, uh, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, basically what you do, uh, if I can, if I can, it's very, very short, if I can run this. Um, yeah, what you do is you paste in an abstract, so there's no way to come up here, you just come up with query words, you hit submit, um, and it's very, again, very, very simple. This is using TF-IDF, right, which is almost like the simplest document measurement you can take. Um, and it finds things in the database which are, are closest in similarity to that. Uh, you can explore them. And the idea is to give you a kind of a process of triage where you're exploring the things that are in the database and, and reusing them. I'm kind of running out of time, so you're up here for the glory alone. <laughs> um, can I just add something about this? Yes, go on. Okay. Uh, actually, do you want to just go through these? Because yeah. we had competing but similar goals. And I have, first I have to say, uh, having strong opinions and working with someone can be really, really hard. But, but working with Dave, mm -hmm. because of his depth of understanding, it was completely different. I had absolutely no uh, friction to accepting that you were right. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a bit, there are so many social things going on there. It was honest, I'm not just giving you a compliment. It was a very interesting situation to be with in a good university. Uh, so going through this and really iterating very rapidly to get something useful in the front end. But uh, as a student, what I wanted was obviously the scholarly copy down here. And the reason for that is, oh my god, I have to get in my paper. I should probably cite my supervisor and some other people here. So this is a very rapid way that I upload either my own abstract or an abstract of something that I know people were interested in that I am citing. Then I get to see what people have done. You click that button, I can cite, 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 cite. And for me as a student, that's obviously very useful and fast, but it also means the department gets more exposure, just like you were saying. So just one final fact. So we're at time, so I'm just going to wrap up. I, so I had some key observations from this from this experience that, that I thought I'd share with you, and I might well be sort of lunch for that. Um, and I, I don't think this is a unique experience to, um, uh, well, even to universities, let alone a UK university. Um, we are so time poor, we never reflect on our practice. Right? That's my first observation. Um, we are constantly firefighting. And we have no time for those kind of, I guess we call them quality processes, about reviewing what we do. Um, the second thing is a little goes a very long way. Um, the systems I've just shown you are, are, are really simple systems using off-the-shelf tools, and they immediately give us something much better than what we get from things like um, our own institutional repository search, for example. Not that there's anything wrong with it, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's going to get worse, Chris. I apologise. Um, so um, I also thought, you know, we miss the old ways, right? Um, all of our digital stuff works pretty well, right? The Wi-Fi tends to be up. The repository is always available. But it's all pretty bad, right? And I think what's happened is that we've traded something, right? Um, certainly our, my observation is over the last 20, 25 years or so, We've increasingly seen professionalization of our IT services and university and institutional management. And that has cost us our agility. And I'm not entirely sure that that was a, a, a deal with the devil that was worth striking. On that point, Joe, yeah. <laughs> any simple questions before we go in over eight? Can I just add something? Please. No. We do have a copy of this live online. If you want to have a play around with it, yeah. just give me a bell. I will also try to put it up on the website, but the website is made with Adobe Muse, which is not supported. So Dave Duroir is supposed to be a speaker, but he, I can't list you. There's nothing wrong. <laughs> but I will try to link to all your presentations and the links on the main website for this uh, when it physically works. Harold, quick one. Uh, I'd love to chat with you over lunch, but professionalism has cost us our agility. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Dunning Kruger, but they have a wonderful phrase. There are some things you can do badly successfully, <laughs> yeah. and professionalism and programming is another yeah. one. You yeah. can do you can do bad programming and you can cover it up and make it look really exciting. 
and people get fooled by that, and people get fooled by bad professionalism. Yeah. That was one of the best. So, so you don't say professionalism is a cost of our agility, bad professionalism. That's one of the best lectures you gave when I was doing my master's with you. You went through all these layers of becoming a professional, and at the top was questioning the whole stack. And we don't have the opportunity to do that much. Uh, ben, something? I was thinking of a somewhat different problem uh, than the professionalization or even bad professionalization. I'm thinking more generally about the brittleness and fragility of the information infrastructure that we're creating. Uh, if you will think just through the course of any day where you've made use of your mobile, and if you think a little bit about all the stuff that had to work for whatever it was you were doing to succeed, uh, you begin to appreciate how fragile this can get. The worst case scenarios, of course, are there's no electrical power available, the battery is dead, and this is a brick. Um, but there are uh, more subtle cases where you were depending on things because they could happen quickly. Uh, for example, creating a presentation, you waited till the last minute because